from the network of the 1992 Olympic Winter Games. Next, CBS Sports presents NCAA Basketball. Welcome everybody to sold out Madison Square Garden. The Big East leaders have arrived here. The Yukon Huskies ready to challenge the St. John's Redmond. Hi everybody, I'm Jim Nansen. Welcome to a Big East matchup for you today. What a floor this has been for the Connecticut Huskies. Yes, this is a home game today for St. John's, but it was here in 88 where they started to turn the program around at Yukon when they won the NIT in 88. In 1990, they became big time in the Big East when they won the conference postseason tournament. We bring in my partner, Billy Packer. And Billy, let's first of all talk about the Big East. It's kind of in a state of flux right now, isn't it? Well, it really is, Jim. And when you think that the coaches predicted preseason, St. John's and Seton Hall at the top. We saw Seton Hall make a nice comeback last week against Ohio State, but St. John's without Wardan is really struggling. They were 1-2, Connecticut was 3. Now look at what really the state of affairs as we know it today. Connecticut up to number one, Georgetown and Syracuse, two middle of the pack teams preseason have come back in here second and third. And way down at sixth and seventh are Seton Hall and St. John's. And for Louis Carnesecca, even though it's February, this day, game is very critical. He's got to get some wins. All right, Billy, we look forward to that. We do have some sad news, however. CBS Sports and the entire college basketball community lost a dear friend last night with the passing of Tom Frericks. He was the longtime athletic director at the University of Dayton. And in September of 91, he had been appointed as the chairman of the NCAA Men's Basketball Committee. Just 16 days ago, the Dayton Fieldhouse was renamed the Thomas Frerichs Athletic and Congregation Center. He's survived by his wife, Rosie, and eight children. CBS Sports coverage of the Road to the Final Four is sponsored by Chevy Trucks, the trucks you can depend on, the trucks that last. Sharp Electronics Corporation, from sharp minds come sharp products. And by McDonald's, where what you want is what you get. Madison Square Garden, New York City. Yukon and St. John's for the second time this season. Yukon won at home by nine on January the 11th. Jim Calhoun's starting front court, Danielle Marshall, the freshman with Terena Walker and Rod Sellers. In the back court, Chris Smith and Scotty Burrell. There's Jim Calhoun, sixth year at UConn. 50 games and even 50 games over 500 for the Huskies. St. John's starting five, Malik Seeley and Sean L. Scott with Mitchell Foster at center. In the backcourt, the point, Jason Buchanan, who needs to get hot today, and Chucky Sproling, the off guard. And there he is, the latest Hall of Famer, Louis Carnesecca, named into the Basketball Hall of Fame just yesterday. Tim Higgins, Tom Corbin, and Mark DeStaola are the officials. Mitchell Foster will jump. He's in for the injured Robert Werdan, who is out with a strained calf muscle and will likely be out for another three weeks. Scott Burrell for UConn. After almost slipping, a three-point opportunity right away. Great hustle by Scott Burrell. Shows that tremendous desire that he has to not only have to go for the ball, whether he's stealing it, or whether he's making a move to the basket. Look at him, keeping balance, used his left hand to support himself, came in for the great shot. Took a lot of athleticism just to stay on your feet there, Billy. And Burrell, back of the iron to Malik Seeley. And here comes St. John's for the first time. Jason Buchanan, the ball handler for the Redmen. Well, Buchanan and Smith matched up last year, the Big East second team guards. And of course, Smith off to the season this year of his life and the fact that he's probably by far the Big East player of the year and Buchanan really struggling. He's got to get started today. Seeley off balance, in and out. And Good Sean rebound. L. Scott, the sophomore, 
on a second try. Good hustle, Seanel Scott. Now, two things we saw right there. Sealy and Scott fired up to go after rebounds. It's going to be a key today. Without Rodan in the lineup, those two fellas really have to pick up the slack. Terena Walker in the lane. And a good box out by Scott on the defensive board. Chucky Sprawling, who was so hot in last year's NCAA tournament from the outside. Great matchup with Burrell and Sealy. Turnaround by Foster. Averages only four points a game, but a quick two for Mitchell Foster. And, and a real key. He was 0 for 7 from the floor against Georgetown. He has shown the ability to be a double-figure scorer, Jim. There's a great pass to Sealy. Goodbye. Jason Buchanan looking ahead. 6-2 St. John. Jim St. John's won 19 straight from 81 to 89 against Connecticut. So if anybody's ever had someone's number, it would be St. John's over the Huskies. Right off the foot of Burrell as Sprawling really forced the steal. You see Buchanan looking ahead and just great hustle by Malik Seeley. And he showed on the opening drive he made to the basket that he's extremely fired up today. You're right, Billy. St. John's leads the all-time series 22 to 5. Including two wins last year over the Huskies, but UConn won a matchup in January this season. Scott, after a good move, comes up short on the jumper, right back to him. Oh, too strong. Another one, and Scott got fouled, still put it back up. How about that? A couple of offensive rebounds already for Scott. Uh, he needs to not raise his hand in the air and, and applaud himself so much. Get back on defense. He's doing the job. The applause will come from this sellout crowd in time. Burrell. Scott with the rebound. rebound. Well, he's doing a lot of jiving out there. Six rebounds and four points for Scott in the game's first two and a half minutes. 8-2 St. John's and Sprawling looking for more and he is clobbered by Danielle Marshall. Let's watch the hustle on this last trip by Sean L. Scott. Well, he puts one up, gets it back, gets pushed from behind and still has a presence of mind to stay in there and put up another one. St. John's a team that's been out-rebounded on the year by their opponents by one a game, dominating the boards here early on. Chucky Sprawling at the line for two. His season high came in that earlier matchup against the Hus Huskies. He had 16 in that game for the best effort of the season. Four out of four, in fact, in that game from three-point land. Now, Jim, think about this young man. He's been a feast or famine player throughout his career. Remember last year in the NCAA tournament? Just got on a roll, and that's what Louis Conacek needs today. Smith, oh, his first Sealy. shot. And Sealy way up for the rebound. And here he is at the other end of the floor. That's the second time that Scott Burrell has not gotten back on defense. Sealy beat him twice, once for the layup and once for the jumper. Timeout called by UConn. A blistering start for St. John's. 9 new inductees into the Basketball Hall of Fame. Lou Carnesecca is one of them, along with your old partner, Al McGuire. And there's Louie. We're so happy for all of those people on there, and so well-deserving are they all. St. John's on an 11-nothing run, and they take it away. No, right back to Smith. And Buchanan with the slap. I'll tell you, someone had uh, got a hold of the rim, and, well, the, and, the, and the backboard was, was shaking. May have taken away a two for Smith. Good call, Jim. That backboard is still moving. We can see it right now shaking back and forth. When a guy goes up and grabs that rim while the ball is in the cylinder or on the rim like that and has it vibrating, you know, that basket could have well scored. Two shots for Smith. Jim Calhoun calling that timeout. Really ripped his players. We see this now. See? He's got his hand on the net. The ball must be in the basket if you grab the net or the rim. So the ball was not in the basket at the time, but without question, he did cause it to vibrate a great deal. Wow, an 80% free throw shooter. Smith misses them both. Calhoun up and at him early here. 
His team's coming out very similar to how UCLA came out against Southern Cal the other night. That's a three. 14 unanswered for St. John's. And St. John's looks like George Rattling's coaching them. <laughs> Just as <laughs> Southern Cal buried UCLA, had them down 41-19 at one point in the first half. Even with Miner out, missing a lot of the first half. Although he came back, and USC will be a team to watch for come March. Sellers on the block. Good post-up position. Foster going right after him. First on Foster. Third on St. John's. 10 to 1 in rebounding right now for the Redmond. To put it in perspective, as I said, St. John's a team that's out-rebounded on the year by their opponents. In Connecticut, a pretty solid rebounding advantage of five a game against theirs. So this has been the key story. UConn scored five seconds into this game as Scotty Burrell scored off the opening tip. Jim, you and I both can remember that game against Georgetown where Sellers went down in the Big East tournament. Nobody ever anticipated he'd be able to return for the season, much less the very next day. He talked about that pain that he suffered in that game with his leg. It was excruciating, but the young kid's tough. He's never missed a game, never. 117 straight at UConn. Here's a 2-2-1 full court zone press. Scott rejected by Marshall. Marshall has as good a timing as a shot blocker as anybody I've seen come into college basketball in a long time. It's not that he's that tall, not that he's that great a leaper, but he has great time. Scrolling, driving past. Walker reached in to knock it away, and they say it belongs to St. John's. Pretty nice piece of officiating there. The two referees looking at each other saying, did you see it? And you know what was nice? The ref one referee said, no, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Dumping it inside, Scott, and a three-point opportunity. He saw that. Burrell coming from the backside, and St. John just catching Connecticut asleep. First on Burrell, second on the Huskies. 16 to 4. Jim, sometimes I think coaches orchestrate, as an example, Bob Knight in the beginning of this season in December. You think they orchestrate these type of games for their team to not want to really play that well early on. Some teams gravitate to it as Connecticut is today, and then you got a guy like Mike Krzyzewski who tries to motivate his team to play better. So different type of coaching situations for different teams. Smith on the Coast to coast drive. That was he, a little too easy. You know, he did not score from the floor against Villanova, so he's able to get off the snide with that one. And that broke his uh, streak of 20 plus games from the three point range as well. A little sloppy, but St. John's Good two pass. on one. Foster hacked by Sellers. And there was a case where Foster tried to prevent the block. He probably was better off just going right for the dump there. Hey, Billy, if you do some quick calculations, the last four years, 24 NCAA berths have been given to the Big East. Only once in the last four years has a Big East team advanced to the Final Four. That was Seton Hall in 89. Yep, lost to Michigan in the finals. So, obviously, a club like Connecticut, which certainly you could project as a Final Four team this year, uh, has got their work cut out for him. One for 24 for the Big East. During the same time as we see Kevin Ollie having checked in at the point for UConn. During that same four year span, the ACC, thanks largely to Duke, is six for 22. Kevin Ollie, a freshman from Los Angeles, California. And the man whose place he took, Chris Smith, out of there. I thought they might bring Ollie in to move Smith to the second guard to create some scoring. Smith is coming right back into the game. Sellers doubled up. Should be a walk. And it Great is. defense that time by Foster. Held his position, hands overhead, and Forrest will travel. Smith right back in for the Huskies for Ollie. You can see the 2-2-1 two, two, full court pressure again, trying to keep the ball out of the middle. Connecticut's whole goal is to run it up the side for double teams. 
Seeley brings it back out to Buchanan. And Connecticut goes zone. 2-1-2. Two, two. Trina Walker in the center. Buchanan. Or oh, is he cold? Louis Karnaseka would love to see that young man drop something. Three-pointer, well short. Smith slipped a little bit. Oh, oh and Scott is hit on the way up. But that's what I talked about, a man taking it, as Scott did, right to the hoop, try to dunk it, and then draw the foul, as opposed to trying to avoid the shot block. That was some pass by Buchanan. I'd, I'll be honest with you. Jim, we're sitting right here and had a pretty good angle. I didn't see that pass I, opportunity there. No way. I didn't see any lane at all. I know. And it had a lot of zip to it also, I'll tell I you th that. I thought Buchanan was throwing that over to Calhoun <laughs> on the bench. They take this one, Coach. Lamont Middleton is in for St. John's. Middleton for a power forward in this league is a little small. Transfer student in here, but I'll tell you, he plays very aggressively, and I think this is the kind of game he'll like. He's in for Foster. You mentioned he's a transfer from the University of Hartford. So he knows about the Huskies success in the last four years. Tradition and enthusiasm in the state of Connecticut for the basketball up there. Lane violation. In the last three games, Middleton's averaging 10 points, seven rebounds a game. He's matched up against Walker. 18 to Good 6, step St. John's. Middleton stepping out. Marshall. Almost tipped in. Seely again. Boy, did he sky on that rebound. Scrolling left open. Middleton. Middleton. Jim, that young man, as I said, he's given away a couple inches down in low. But he's just a battler, kind of a wide body, strong legs. Had four point, four games in which he scored over 30 up at Hartford, so he knows how to put some points in there. Burrell hit on the wrist by Sprawling. His second. You know, Duke has really been the nemesis of these two teams the last two years in the NCAAs. They both have been knocked out in the 90 and 91 tournament by Duke. It's kind of bizarre to see two teams from the Big East sent to the same regional well, two straight years. I'm going to compliment my broadcast partner here, Mr. Nance. Okay. You always forecast those those things properly, and you told me today, which we're going to go on record, that it will yep. be Duke number one in the East going to Greensboro, which and is, and makes sense, right? Connecticut number two going to Worcester. Now, fans out there, my partner is never wrong on these things, so go ahead and count on buying your tickets now. Well, I will say this. I did forecast a Georgetown I, UNLV. Hey, I'm not, I'm I not thought blowing you, smoke I, here. I thought you, you were you, being facetious. No, I'm not. You're the best I've been around with that stuff. It makes a lot of sense, though. Wooster's only about a 45-minute drive from scores and put UConn as the two-seed in the East. But we have a whole month and a half of basketball change things before well, that's the earliest you've come up with it. Yep. Okay, staying in the zone is Connecticut. Derek Brown in for the Redmond. I have to forecast these things early, Billy, because I'm leaving for the Olympics. <laughs> Give you something to think about. And I'll tell you something that Louis Karnasek is thinking about. Please, Jason Buchanan, get a three-point shot and hit it. Oh, he was able to feel that one. And you don't want to be over here on Burrell's side if you're thinking about shooting. He's got a little bit too much size for him. Good hand by Scott. A good dish by Brown to the inside. Scott with excellent hands in traffic. Scott averages seven. He already has eight. And we're not even halfway through the opening period. Real nice help by Seeley. Seeley gets the outlet to Derek Brown. You know, Jim Calhoun's got to be wondering, what in the world is this game we're seeing here? 24 to 7. Largest lead of the game for St. John's. And we're talking about Robert Wardan, the man that St. John's has missed so much, sitting on the bench. How about Smith? How about that one going in? Well, he got fouled on the arm on the way up. Not on the release, but on the way up and still made the shot. Scott's got Middleton. Middleton, four points off the bench. 
did not give Marshall a chance to come over for the shot to block it. Going the other way. Frustration foul by Torreno Walker. Torreno Walker and an official timeout on the floor. 11.27 to go in the first half. It's all St. John's. Well, there's your leaderboard through two rounds at Pebble Beach. P.H. Horgan the third and Bob Lohr. But look out for Marco Mira. He's won this tournament three times. How about Lenny Watkins? He's tough always I on the West Coast you. swing. He's, yep. You always look after the weight guys, but you can't go wrong with that pick. That's coming up after basketball. Spreading it out, the press has not been a factor. St. John's hasn't turned it over one time, and Connecticut has as good a pressure defense as anybody in the country full court. Fair and Smith out front, smaller target. Here's Buchanan, this is a big shot. Yeah. He just cannot drill it. But long enough on the rebound to get to Seeley, who's now left open. Base runner for Seeley. Good rebound by Brian Fair, a freshman for UConn, in for the first time. So UConn with his starting five, except for Fair. And Seeley again, impressive rebounding. Jim, that's the fourth rebound he's taken today. Not a good pass by Buchanan. Cross court, too long a distance. Seeley with six rebounds, Billy. 26 to nine as we approach the midway point of the first half. And Jim for Buchanan, that's 12 for these last 59 shots. And we're talking about a fella pretty solid offensively in the past until he's gotten into this streak. He's got to keep shooting the ball. There's a big one. Roy Karnaseko runs down the sideline in that one. Believe me, he's been dying with this young man. And puts him up by 20. I think we'll see Connecticut make a run even in the first half, much as UCLA did against Southern Cal. Too good a team to stay this far back. This kid can shoot, but he's guarded up this time by Derek Brown. And now Terrena Walker kicks it back out to Sellers. Over to Burrell. Here's a three. Six for Burrell. He has half the Huskies total. Scott coming out now. Bringing the zone out, trying to trap out high. Seeley, St. John's just doesn't cool off. Now, one of the weaknesses in that type of trap is the baseline jumper, and there isn't anybody in the country that's got a better 15 to 18 foot shot on the baseline than Malik Seeley. So far, Buchanan doing a pretty good job keeping Smith away from the ball. And fair. Been running again at St. John's. Brown with Smith trailing. Jim, does this remind you at all the way St. John's attacked Ohio State? Remember last year in the NCAA tournament, Ohio State was putting so much pressure, sending a lot of guys to the boards, and St. John's played right over the top of them and went long. Sweet 16 game where they knocked out the one seed in the Midwest. Got him into the round of eight against Duke. Now with the largest lead, and nice Burrell pass, cuts it back down. It's 33 to 14. And he's doing that against Malik Seeley, who's one of the better defenders around. Back in a full court pressure again. Nice pass by Brown. He looked at a little slow. If he'd have been ready to take the jumper, he had it. By the time he reacted and got himself squared around to shoot, it was too late. Lobbing it. Malik Seeley. A solid screen by Middleton against the back of the zone. Set play worked to perfection. Buchanan with six assists. Not getting a lot down inside. There's an awful lot of good help from the weak side by St. John's. Looks like they're going to the little box inside. Smitty goes one on one with Buchanan. Low uh, it, dribble. It may step. be low, Jim, but it's an illegal dribble. And I, know, I know the people in Connecticut don't want to hear it, but he just carries that ball all the time when he uses that dribble. Now we see the backside. See Middleton set the solid screen, 
No way for Burrell to get over there, not realizing that Malik Seeley was coming in behind. Now watch what happens. There's the solid screen set. Burrell would normally be back there to defend too late when he realizes that Seeley has come in from the backside. Brian Fair goes out. UConn has its starting five back on the floor. Second foul against Mitchell Foster. Again, the Big East allows six personals. Jim Nance along with Billy Packer from the Garden in New York. And Walker just a 44% free throw shooter. If there is a weakness on this club, and it's pretty solid in all other areas, it is on the free throw line, where as a team they only shoot 67%, with Walker, of course, the lowest of the starters. Two for Walker this time, and an official's timeout. But it's still St. John's by 19. To summarize here in this first half, Malik Seeley has more rebounds than the entire UConn team. In fact, Sean L. Scott has six rebounds, also outpacing the entire Husky squad. Jim, here's where the press could work. Kane and Brown in the backcourt now for St. John's. So with Buchanan out, if Connecticut's going to take advantage of the inexperience, they've got to do it. And UConn has brought in Donnie Marshall, another freshman, not to be confused with Danielle Marshall. They're both on the floor for the Huskies. And playing straight man-to-man -man here. Seely. Good hands. That was Seely. Got his hands back in there. But it was all set up by Middleton's good move. Power move down inside, even though he didn't score. Well, Donnie Marshall's power for the last game against Illinois. He didn't play. Three pointer for Smith. And here, if, if you're. Jim Calhoun, you have to assume you're going to turn it over against this backcourt. If they don't do it here, they're going to be in trouble. Seely. Not getting any backside help. It's amazing that St. John's is attacking right down the sidelines, which is where Calhoun wants the ball to be forced. Tried to save it. Belongs to UConn. St. John's is 10 and 7 on the year. UConn is 16 and 1 and ranks sixth in the country. And there's your Tom Penders game, and a struggle for Tom Penders in Texas. And they have uh, they put themselves behind the eight ball a little bit too in terms of an NCAA tournament berth. Marshall missing the jumper. Texas lost in fact to this UConn team. UConn beat them in Austin pretty handily. Did you notice Middleton that time looking down court, trying to go for the outlet pass right away? Wasn't there and held it up. Seeley on the blocks. And he leaned into Marshall. They say the foul, the body contact by Marshall. Boy, a great job to get a shot blocker and take the ball right to him as Seeley did. And that's the sixth team foul against UConn. And at the conclusion of this game, we'll be selecting a Chevrolet most valuable player from each school. Chevrolet donates a check for $1,000 to the General Scholarship Fund of each college. Seeley, 12 points, 9 rebounds. Jim, talking about most valuable players, how about Lawrence Moten up at uh, Syracuse this year. He has been the Big East Rookie of the Week five times already in this season. Not that heralded when he came into the league, but boy, he's been turning it upside down since he's had a chance to play for Jim Beheim's squad. He's the best newcomer, and I'd have to say Danielle Marshall's the second in the Big East. There's Marshall. Good long rebound. Touch by St. John's Middleton. Boy, there is a fight with Donnie Marshall and Middleton down inside. Two bruisers, both probably weigh in around 220. Same size, and they are doing some pushing and shoving inside. 41 to 19. That's the same score as that first half that game. Amazing. USC UCLA and scoring inside is Rod Sellers. That's a, this game reminded me of that right off the bat. I never anticipated it come down to the 41-19, though. Boy, what Seeley had in mind, and if he had had Scott, I think he would have thrown the lob pass for the dunk. I don't, I don't think he thought Middleton could get to it. 
Under five minutes to go in the half. Payne dishes off to Middleton and a three-point opportunity. Now, I mentioned how Middleton has come off the bench in the last three games to average over 10 points and seven rebounds a game, and he has really been a key here today for Louis Karnasek. This power in his way in there. And he knows how to score at the University of Hartford. He had four games where he scored over 30 points. Had to sit out last year on the transfer. And you know, Jim, some of those games he had 30 uh, or more against Fairfield, Siena, and GW. So it's not like he was, was doing it against weak sisters. Ollie in for Donnie Marshall. So Ollie and Smith in the game at the same time. And Middleton will try to make it a three-point play and give St. John's its largest lead. And there was Burrell moving back off, so he should get another free shot here. Yep. You know, we we both observed Jim Calhoun, who's one of the neat guys in college basketball coaching. And you know how he's normally very vocal and expressive? He is very quiet today. Those kind of personalities that get quiet, you know he is heating up for something special in this halftime locker room. I mean, look at how quiet and, and relaxed he seems. Inside, he has got to be going crazy. I don't think I've ever seen him this expressionless in a ball game before. Well, they called a violation here, a lane violation on Sealy, so they took away the made free throw by Middleton. What do you expect yeah. it's going to be like in the locker room? Uh, I think there are things that are going to be flying. I mean, you get your seat. <laughs> You put your hands down, you keep your head down, say nothing, don't smile, don't cry, and just expect flying objects because that's what's going to happen in that Connecticut locker room. He is hot. 43-21. Smith turnaround. So nice. Just squared up. Didn't put the ball on the floor. Now with nine points. Huskies leading score two years ago, last year, and again this year. Yesterday at practice, Seton Hall, I mean, uh, St. John's worked against this press a great deal. They worked against two things, stepping out anytime there was a solid screen and how they were going to attack the press. They sure are doing a good job with it. St. John's has already scored more points than it did in that crazy <laughs> loss to Miami, 45 42, the lowest scoring game in Big East history. 14 to 12 at halftime. That goes. Yes. David Kane. We have more college basketball action coming your way tomorrow. Ohio State and Jim Jackson take on the freshman from Michigan, from Ann Arbor. That begins at 1 o'clock tomorrow here on CBS. Ohio State struggling a little bit getting that combination back now that Funderburk looks like he's solidly entrenched in the lineup and Michigan as long as those guys play hard and scared those youngsters play extremely well when they seem to get overconfident that they don't play anywhere near as well good backdoor cut Bear has it partially blocked and into the hands of Seeley no, 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 no chance Marshall on the steal Almost right back was Kane. Burrell two on one, and he led Fair too much. Well, Jim, I think Fair stopped running. He had the angle for the shot. He just pulled up. 3.54 to go in the half, and officials timeout. St. John's by 22. Well, coming up, at the Prudential at the half, news from Alberville. Paul Azan and Tim McCarver will have an update from there for us. And Mike Francesa will join us in a discussion of some teams that face a long road to the final four, some teams that must try to march through February. Teams that have to do what St. John's is doing right now. Richie Ashmead has come in. He's defending now. Derek Brown. You see Connecticut picking up their man-to-man -man a little bit higher out now. Trying to turn the ball over. Middleton just slipped right out of his hands. And he was ready to go for the pump fake. Only the fourth turnover against the Redmen. Sproling comes in. Jim, St. John's shooting 63%. Connecticut's been holding their opponents to 41%. As we remember, they, 
They were third in the nation last year in field goal percentage defense. So to shoot 63%, nobody has done anything close to that this year. Smith with good hands to save a kind of a wide pass. Fouled on the arm. Thursday night, share a moment with the world, a preview of the 16th Olympic Winter Games. Paul Azan and Tim McCarver will host the Olympic preview from Moutier, France. And that's where the International Broadcast Center is for the Albertville Games. And the Olympic flame will be lit one week from about this time. And we'll have it, in fact, the coverage for you will be at 8 o'clock Eastern time, which will be 2 in the morning in the Savoie. Smith back on the line. That was the third foul on scrolling and Jim back to the you know the Big East situation. That's not really that critical when you've got six. But Louis Karnasek is going to sit him down right now behind him. Louis in that green sweater. He's had to change a lot of sweaters this year. He has. He goes any two losses within a sweater that sweater gets retired. All right. Our buddy Mike Francesa gave him a one sweater and Duke retired that one two times in a row. <laughs> well, got him to the final eight in the tournament last year. And Louie brought it back for that ACC Big East Challenge in December and they lost to Duke again. In fact, he may have burned that one. He not only didn't wear it anymore, he eliminated it. Good ball fake that time by Scott. Looking down inside. Brown is blocked. Good job just getting that shot off. That's a hack on the arm by Walker. 2.50 to go in the first half. 45 25, St. John's. Now, Calhoun that time waved at the official like the, the official made a big mistake there. There's no question that Walker committed that. And if I'm Calhoun, I've got to be real careful here. With 2.50 to go, the last thing you want is a two shot technical and the ball back to St. John's, particularly when you're going to get it. That's the second on Walker, the ninth on Connecticut. So a one and one for Middleton. Stayed with a shot nicely. Shoots under 60, and you saw why in the second. Another foul against Terrena Walker, I believe. Just pushing off inside. No, it's going against Rod Sellers. Sellers pushed off. That's his second. And now the double bonus. They'll shoot two free throws. Will St. John's Malik Seeley. Sellers replaced by Dan Cerulek. Seven footer. Not very characteristic of Sellers' play. He, shows, he has shown great leadership at his time at Connecticut. Just kind of losing a little bit here today. There's Dan Sarulik, a senior from Williamsville, New York. Malik shooting 81% from the line, so that was a nice uh, twist for Louis Karnasecki. He had a 58% shooter off, put an 81% shooter on. Sealy, in his, as we remember early in his career, was a woeful free throw shooter, very uncharacteristic of his form. Ashmi, that's a three pointer away short and yeah. wide. What you want to do here, you down this far, is make sure Chris Smith touches the ball a lot more than he has been. Start back out, Middleton. Oh, oh, underneath the cylinder was Sealy. Had no chance. That would have been a pretty good pass. Here's the man to touch the ball. Oh, oh three right open here. Burrell comes down quickly. Oh. Tipped in by Scott. St. John's is just out hustling Connecticut all over the floor. That was Scott that ran 75 feet there to put it back in and just beat everybody other than Burrell from Connecticut down the floor. They have doubled up the Huskies, 50 to 25. And UConn not showing any signs at any time of this half penetrating the lead and again they miss Smith off on the three uh, they've gotten completely Jim away from their offense too you know if Smitty's going to have the ball at the top right now you want to take a better shot than just a wild three 
penetrate, get to the foul line, try to get the ball inside some, get back to your basic offense, and try to come against this 25-point margin a little at a time. And they're trying to get it all back with a couple of shots. That's not going to work. Pretty nice defense. And good, patient offense. Middleton. Oh, he bounced over to receive the pass and looked confident the whole way through on that one. Well, we talked at the top of the show about the crazy Big East. And how about this game? I mean, this may be the craziest game in the Big East this year, with the exception maybe of that Miami St. John's game in reverse. Sarulik will go to the line. Sealy looks like he's hurt over there. He's limping, uh, and Sproling's going to go in for him. I don't know if it's an ankle or a thigh. Sproling is. Uh, well, he's got three fouls, and what happened? Yep. Good piece of uh, coaching by the assistants there to warn Louis Conaseca that with just 54 seconds, don't put Sproling into the game. So they bring in Lee Green. Green comes in to replace Sealy. Yeah. I can't see whether it's ankle. But he looks like he's in some pain. Two shots for Dan Cerula. Now you just have to assume, if you're Connecticut, that St. John's going to want to hold the ball a little bit. So I think on their press, they should really take some big chances here. See if they can't get St. John's a little bit more passive attitude. And if you're St. John's, you might want to strike for a quick one. Seeley will sit out the rest of the half with 16 points and 12 rebounds. Double-double achieved in the first 20 minutes. Well, Sealy, Smith, and Alonzo Mourning are the statistical leaders of the Big East so far this year. Sealy hasn't let him down in his first half. Derek Brown doubled up, gets it back out to the new entry into the lineup, Lee Green. About a seven-second differential on the shot clock to the game clock. And if you're St. John, just let it wind on down. They've got it down to eight. Let's see if they'll set up a one-on-one -on -one situation for Buchanan. Three for Buchanan. Uh, Middleton right into his arms and missing the lay. And back. And what a first half. What a first half. The young man who spent two years in the state of Connecticut at Hartford putting on a show. He is tough. 7.5 seconds to go. Doubled up the score, 54 to 27. Well, Middleton was two for seven against Connecticut in the first game, but he has done it from the very second he walked into this game today as a sub. He has been the middle of everything down inside. Three on Terena Walker, and Danielle Marshall comes in. Scott, Scott Burrell will sit. St. John's, are they the one and one yet, Swanee? Is that? Both teams in the one and one. I was going to say with seven seconds, a pretty good time. Maybe even foul to prevent. You want to prevent them from getting off the three here. And of course, they got the ball in the hands of the guy they want to touch it. Oh, they missed the open five footer. Calhoun is the first one to the locker room. This will be interesting. A stunning first half performance by St. John's. The Redmen lead it 54 to 27. We'll return to the garden after this message and a word for your local station. CBS Sports presents The Prudential at the Half. Sponsored by the companies of the Prudential. Come to the Prudential and build your future on the rock. A first half score that's hard to believe. St. John's 10 and 7 on the year, leading the sixth ranked Connecticut Huskies 54 27. UConn has lost only one time all season coming into this game. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Prudential at the half. In just a few minutes, Billy Packer will be joining us for a discussion of teams that must come up with a big February to make the field in March. But right now, let me 
bring back uh, Mike Francesa. And Mike, what about this first half performance by your alma mater? I think everything that had gone wrong in recent weeks went right for St. John's. I don't think UConn came out to play that hard. St. John's, that play by Middleton at the end of the half epitomized everything. Get it back, get it back, get up on the boards. They just killed UConn every phase of the game, especially on the boards in the first half. All right, Mike, let's breeze through some scores real fast. And Big Ten action, Iowa 22 up on Minnesota at home. Virginia and NC State Virginia must rally late in the season beating the Wolfpack in Raleigh at the moment in the second half and the Tommy Pender special playing against Rhode Island the team he led to the Sweet 16 in 1988 taking his Longhorns there this time tied in the first half and uh, Mike you got some news on Texas well Dexter Cambridge were expecting him to come back and settle his problems and be back for the rest of the season and that'll be a big K that'll really lift the Longhorn team they'll play better down a stretch Mike the countdown continues Finally. for the Olympics <laughs> We're seven days away from the opening ceremonies in Alberville and uh, let's get you a report right now from the Savoie with our primetime hosts from over there Paul Azan and Tim McCarver with an update from the Olympic site. We apologize for that uh, technical error, but again, the uh, countdown continues. We're seven days away. We have seven days to get the audio repaired before next week's opening ceremonies. Okay, when we come back, Mike, we're going to talk with Billy Packer about the state of the college basketball world right now in our country and some teams to look out for in the weeks ahead. Stay with us on At the Half. These are honors America's Olympians, like Tracy Fuchs of the University of Connecticut and Chris Mullen of St. John's University. Today, collegiate athletes are in training for the 92 Olympics, and Visa will donate $1,000 to each of these universities and $1,000 to the 1992 U.S. Olympic team for their efforts in the development of our future U.S. Olympians. Still the greatest city in the world. What better place for a university? A university with the largest college of pharmacy and one of the top law schools in the country. With nationally accredited colleges of business and affordable tuition. The least expensive of any private university in New York State. Yes, the city is New York. And the university is St. John's. Malik Seeley, 16 points, 12 rebounds. The Redmond outrageous in the first half. And welcome back to At the Half. And my partners for the first week of the tournament, about six weeks away in the studio. And uh, Billy, let's talk about some teams now that must really rally even to get into the tournament. Well, we started the show today talking about St. John's. Of course, they have played about as good a basketball as they can play. We saw Virginia leading today. A 9-8 and eight club, both Virginia and Villanova remind me a lot alike. They'd be very difficult teams to face in the NCAA tournament. But, Mike, as you can see right now, you know, you've got to be over 500. They took on very aggressive preseason schedules. And that's something to watch in the future for these teams. As these big conferences expand their teams so that they've got to play more conference games, they have to question whether you're going to continue to play real tough December ball games. It may come back to hurt you come March when it's selection time. Well, Raleigh Massimino and Jeff Jones both took on very aggressive preseason schedules. And Mike already told me he thinks both of those teams will be on the sidelines for the tournament. I do think so. All right, what about where are they now? Teams that were in the preseason polls ranked very high, Mike? Well, LSU's playing better now, Jimmy. St. John's, I think, has been the most disappointing team in the country despite the first half today. And Seton Hall, I thought Jimmy was overrated from the start of the season. And what about where did they come from? Well, I think the thing that, that's interesting there, Missouri and Syracuse, you have Jimmy Bayheim and Norm Stewart, two coaches that are often maligned, but this year they've got their teams playing uh, extremely well, and I'm really happy for them. All right, guys, I'll tell you what, we're going to send it right back now to Alberville. We've straightened out our audio problems. Let's go back now. Paul Azan and Tim McCarver in that report. 
Thank you, Jim. The weather here in the Alps has been actually relatively mild this week as preparations continue for the 16th Olympic Winter Games, which will get underway one week from today. Hi, everybody. I'm Tim McCarver. Hi, I'm Paula Zahn. And Paula, controversy already today as some 40 French taxi drivers block traffic at a key crossroads leading to several Olympic venues. Operation Escargo, as they called it, is designed to pressure authorities into giving the taxi drivers access to all roads during the Olympics. You better not do that during the Olympics. <laughs> it slow right. things down a lot. There was no slowdown, however, among the world's best skiers. Just up the road at Mejev, it was a big day for Swiss ace Paul Akala, who cleared a key hurdle and virtually locked up the overall World Cup crown with his first ever super giant slalom victory. The women were active over in Switzerland, where Austria's Sabina Ginter captured the final World Cup downhill before the Olympics. And Paula, we probably could use a little more snow here before next week, but we have no shortage of ice, and there's no limit to what can be done with it. There are folks who are sculpting the ice, and others who are busy climbing the ice. Some are even, even diving beneath the frozen water. And of course, U.S. national champion Christopher Bowman will soon be skating on it. Hi, I'm Christopher Bowman, and I'm leaving for Albertville, about to share a moment with the world. And we hope you'll also share a moment with the world and with us. Our coverage begins with a special preview on Thursday night at 8 Eastern, 7 Central Time. That's the story from Tim and me for now, here in France. All right, thank you, Tim and Paula. And don't forget that third round action from Pebble Beach is coming up after this game. And the current leaderboard, Mark O'Meara, there he is, by one over Lanny Watkins. So they're on the back nine. Mike, nice to share a moment with you. And uh, Billy Packer, let's go get back on headsets. Getting set for the second half, St. John's and UConn. And the Redmen lead the Big East leaders 54 to 27. We'll be back in just a moment. The Prudential at the half was sponsored by The Prudential. Come to the companies of The Prudential and build your future on the rock. CBS Sports coverage of the road to the final four is sponsored by Mazda Cars and Trucks. Mazda, it just feels right. Blockbuster Video, more movies than anyone in the world. And by Keystone and Keystone Light bottle beer taste in a can. Wouldn't that be great? All right, before the second half starts, let's introduce the newest analyst at CBS Sports, Digger Phelps. It's good to have you with us, and I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the patch off. And yeah. He has no pocket. Yeah, I, I, right, you got it. Good. I got it. it looks right good. Here. It fits. It fits. No. What do you think of the college basketball season so far? <laughs> Exciting as ever. I mean, we saw it happen the other night with Southern Cal at Pauley Pavilion getting it done. You see it today here where St. John's comes out, starts out with the attack on the boards. Next thing you know, Connecticut falls asleep, and they got a problem. But that's college basketball at its best. You said a minute ago you think this is upset special week. This week, next weekend, you'll see more upsets coming out. This is where the teams that are up high on a cloud all of a sudden disappear. Connecticut's doing it today, and, and I think the first five minutes they better wake up or it's, it's over. You looking forward to putting the headset on and uh, working some games? Yeah, I, I just think it's exciting to know that March Madness as you come out. I mean, there's the wild card teams, the Florida States as we take Southern Cal's another one. And, of course, Connecticut still can make the final eight. That, so when you look at what goes on in college basketball, it's never over. And Villanova's another dark horse again. This year, as you see what happens uh, with them in the way they come back in the big games. Digger, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Looking Jane. forward to hearing you during March. Did I get to keep this? Keep it. Take it. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> take the headset, too. <laughs> and let's look at the first half numbers. St. John's, 56%. UConn, only 32 percent. I have on front court scoring there, Billy Packer. Amazing, 41 to eight, and a, and a real key, of course. We saw Sealy and Scott take off right from the very beginning, but the, I, I think the real key is when Middleton came in off the bench and just set the stage down in low. Foster back on the floor right now. Middleton out. So Louis in good shape in every respect. Not only the score, but the, nobody in foul trouble. His team playing extremely well. Sealy short. Off the glass and Sellers for UConn. Well, there's a change. Connecticut sending four to the boards and really being up there banging. Too good a team to keep down for so long. And I would expect they get back into their offensive game 
Just trying to come back gradually here. That was Scott on a foul. Got a piece of the arm. No call. Nope. St. John's basketball. Down 27, Billy. Realistically, how close do you think UConn can get in this? Oh, I think they can make a run. I really do. I think they can make a run two ways. One, get back into their offense a little better. Oh, oh, four point opportunity. And that a Marshall. Three. Marshall trying to go for the block. Chucky Sproling, who's been on the bench in some foul trouble, hits the three. We talked about him being a streaky shooter and player, and he just buried that one, and there you see him flat on his back. Marshall goes out, tries to block, can't hold up at all. No question about the foul. Four-point play for Sproling. Oh, oh, no, are they going to call that? You saw that Sellers went down. Foster gets called for the foul. I thought Sellers was going to pick up another cheap one. Well, the free throw counts, so the lead is extended to 31. That's the third foul against Foster. And it's really difficult to keep your patience being down this much, not trying to bring it back so quickly. Sellers, he'll shoot two. Sellers just buried his head and drove into the basket. There's Iowa, one of the teams we talked about, Jim, that you know, has to start winning some big games, and Virginia both coming uh, across very well now. Rod Sellers. Takes just finally takes the lead. Here's a guy, Billy, that sounds kind of like the Kevin Salvadori story we heard down in North Carolina when he was recruited after not even scoring a point in the game. The coaches from Carolina witnessed. Rod Sellers played in the South Carolina State ah! High School All-Star game, and he, too, did not score a single point, but Jim Calhoun recruited him, brought him here, and he's been such a key part of this team for four years. Some pretty good players playing that game. Everett Sullivan, Louisville. Joe Rett, Stanley Roberts, formerly of LSU. No basket for Seeley. Contact before on Burrell. That's his third, second on UConn in the second half. You get six personal fouls in the Big East. Jimmy mentioned Joe Rett. I think it's an incredible story that a young man now going through a series of tests, and if he can pass those tests, he'll be able to go back out and play again. Sprawling wildly, and rebound by Danielle Marshall. He lost the ball, and that's what prevented him from not being called for walking. Had he held on to it, the up and down would have turned it over. See the team looking for Smitty now. He'll bring us back, fella. Here he is. And scrolling's open. You can't and just can't get the handle on it. He knew he was out there, too. Yep. St. John's really looking for the break today, taking advantage of it in every, every regard. And there's, Burrell thought that there was a solid screen by Sproling that was illegal, and he tried to fight over it. Instead, Burrell gets the foul. And that's four on Burrell. Two quick ones here in the second half, and Donnie Marshall is going to come in for Burrell. Well, I think Burrell had a point there, because a screener has got to be stationary. And scrolling was still moving when the contact was made. Foster getting pretty good position down in low, but nobody delivering the ball. A lot of time on the clock. Good patience here by St. John's. I mean, you don't want to go into any kind of delay game, but you want to make sure you get good shots. You're up 30. You got to shorten the game. Nice pass. Scott, and almost tipped in by Seeley. Well, that's a dangerous play that time by Donnie Marshall to throw the ball right back in under the other team's basket. Had Seeley been able to get a handle on that, he had an easy lay-in.
There's that step out. The defensive play that St. John's is working on in practice a great deal yesterday. It's been effective for him. Sealy with another rebound, Jim. As Marshall came high over the top, did not make contact. Smith Sealy. is down. Somebody's open. Sealy missing. Both teams starting out cold in the second half. Oh, that wasn't even close. Dwayne Walker. Cannon was on the line. I really like the defensive technique by St. John's underneath the basket. They're putting their hands above their head, maintaining solid defensive position, and not trying to chop at the ball. And that's why they're not fouling down inside. A tough shot. Two air balls in a row by Smith. Just wasn't there. And as you mentioned, Smith 0 for 7 against Villanova the other day. Broke his streak at 23 straight three points, but didn't even hit a field goal from the floor. Scott keeps it alive. Foul on Foster. And for Foster, now that is four. That's going to bring Middleton back into the ball game, and he was the spark plug in the first half. Scott Burrell back in along with Brian Fair. So Burrell comes back in with four. Foster sits down with four, and Jim Calhoun's got to figure out a way to start getting some offense going because he has not been able to create offense with his defense today. And that's usually a key for Connecticut. Burrell, that's an NBA three. Rattled out. An NBA three coming in off the bench. You know, Jim, that... Not, not a very wise play. UConn is 0 for 7 from the floor in this half. <laughs> Connecticut has forced St. John's to slow things down a little bit, but they're just not scoring themselves. <laughs> would have been the first fast break of any account for Connecticut, and they can't convert. Right back to Scott. This time, he gets oh, his own roll. Over Marshall. Everything breaking right for St. John's today. There's that good check by uh, Malik Seeley. Marshall, and knocked out by Scott. An official's timeout, under 15 minutes remaining. St. John's is playing a big game at the Garden today, but we'll talk a little baseball right now with Barry Bonds, and of course, Bobby Benia, who was presented a St. John's uniform before the game. How about the St. John's? You know, you know, in New York, they expect this kind of explosion every day. So I've been told by you, Mike. I mean, again, it's really exciting for me to be able to uh, see the Redmond play, and it's a big thrill for myself today. Barry, how about you? What brings you to New York here? Bobby Bonilla. Uh, uh, we, just, <laughs> we go way back, and he's a St. John's fan, so I wore the colors to Diamond. Now, you just signed a new contract yesterday, $4.7 million for one year. Are you going to then follow in his footsteps? Yeah, I'm going to go to free agency. I'm just going to play out my one year, and then hopefully we can play together again. Thanks, guys. Let me go back to Jim Nance. Jimmy? Right. Middleton, Jim. Middleton again. He's been the money player today on this court right here. We talk about the money men, but Middleton has been the money player. And that's about how many times have we seen today, Jim, where the ball goes up on the board and St. John's getting three or four attempts to put it back up. Now, Middleton, six foot five, and gets another good layup on the inside. In the first half, the young man only played 14 minutes. He had 11 points, three solid rebounds, was five for eight. Now he's six for nine. He's getting the job done. Smith, good bounce pass to Marshall. And UConn had missed its last 13 shots when you go back to the end of the first half. Now Marshall and Middleton doing a lot of talking to each other right now on the floor. I would expect to see some bumping down inside if Middleton gets that ball. He wants it with Marshall on it. Solid 
Pilot screen, here he comes. Gets the switch with Sellers on him now. Scott Scott open underneath. Picks nice it right pass. back out to Middleton. Another offensive rebound. Seeley, somebody came over the back of Seeley, but it's St. John's basketball. Seeley has set a new career high with 18 rebounds. He's got a chance with 13 minutes to go to get up around 25 rebounds. Now Michael Smith of Providence the other night with 22 rebounds against this Connecticut club. So somebody not blocking out and not taking anything away from Smith or Seeley, but those kind of numbers just aren't supposed to happen. Look at Seeley. That was some move. Well, he went back. He's going backwards down court faster than Burrell. Fair three-pointer. Freshman Brian Fair, the Arizona High School Player of the Year, 1991. And Jim, I said at the start of the half, it's not good to try to come back all at once, but now Connecticut has to be thinking three-point shots. I mean, there's 12 minutes to go, and they're not turning the ball over on the defensive end at all. There's another pull-up by Seeley. He just eats Scott Burrell alive today. Seeley with 20 points, 18 rebounds. And we have seen Scott Burrell perform as one of the better defenders in college basketball. So it's not like he's uh, doing it against a weak sister here. There's Burrell on the offensive end. Seeley bumped him. His first, his first personal, fifth against the Redmen in this half. You know, Louis Karnasek is 8 and 11. Billy, let me first mention okay, that the third round coverage from Pebble Beach will be coming up next. Mark O'Meara. Has a one-shot lead at the moment over Lanny Watkins and Dan Pohl having come back from a serious back ailment. He's in third. I was saying, Louis second has won eight of 11 matches against Jim Calhoun since Jim's been in the Big East. And sometimes, for some reason, you just happen to have a guy's number. This would more than likely make it nine out of 12. That's the second foul on Sean L. Scott. Hey, if you Husky fans who are feeling a little despair at the moment, think back to the game here two years ago against St. John's in the regular season. In that game, the Redmen won 93 to 62, a 31 point thrashing of the Huskies, who then later came on, really rebounded. They were ignited by that bad performance, and it came back to win the Big East tournament and make it to the final eight of the NCAAs that same season. Remember, Jim, that season they were predicted to finish eighth preseason in the Big East and came back to win it all. Of course, nobody realized how much of a factor in the Dove Hennefeld was going to be. And just think, you know, he would be a senior now had he stayed at Connecticut. Last year's Pennsylvania State Player of the Year, Danielle Marshall, and he's lived up to everything that his McDonald's All-American status said he would be. First McDonald's All-America recruit was Danielle Marshall since Corny Thompson. And Tim Higgins steps in to back away Sean L. Scott and Rod Sellers. Well, if you are St. John's right now, the last thing you want to do is to get in a conversation with somebody. I mean, they've let their playing do the talking for them so far. Let Connecticut be the one that has to vent their anger. 66-34. The Johnnies. Just a small thing there, but did you notice the ball fake that time by Middleton? Just froze the defense. And St. John's been doing that well today. They have not turned it over against the press yet. Perfect pass by Buchanan. St. John's has once again doubled the score, 68-34. Well, we are not seeing a UCLA-type second-half comeback. They never, got it down. Never developed. Right, they got it from 41-19 down to three. That three trims it to 31. This is the second alley-oop of the day from Buchanan to Sealy. You notice the rotation on the ball, Jim. Almost threw it up there like a knuckler, so it would be easy to catch and be able to put it away. Nice play by both players. And officials, timeout. Monster numbers for Sealy and Sean L. Scott with a double-double as well. 
And it's 68-37 St. John. Jim Nance along with Billy Packer from the Garden. Sold out. You saw that bench scoring there, which is something that has really changed for Connecticut. You know, Jim Calhoun thought his bench would be pretty strong this year. But of late, they have not been getting much productivity off of there. And he's had to go with his starters most of the time. Lamont Middleton committing a foul away from the ball. That's his second. And the seventh against St. John's put UConn on the line with a one and one. The Garden sold out. And that can be attributed to a massive following from the Connecticut fans. Well, Jim, think of when Connecticut came into the league, you know, obviously they'd play out at St. John's on campus because Connecticut, one of the weak sisters in the league, figured they're not going to have much of a following. Jim Calhoun made it very clear today. He said, we will never play again any place other than Madison Square Garden when we come to New York. A great testimony to the way he's built that program and the way the people of Connecticut have supported it. One and one for Marshall. Think of some of the kids that have come into the Big East this year. We mentioned Lawrence Moten, who's uh, playing so well. Marshall, who's playing well. Jerry McCullough out at Pitt doing well. Michael Smith, although he was a, he's a prop 48 last year, not a freshman, he's playing extremely well. So the league has got a lot of outstanding young players. Well, they now get it under 30. And it's 68-39. Full court pressure still by the Huskies. Well, Brown missed Scott. If Scott was open. You've got to deliver the pass, and it didn't go. Timeout called by the Redmen with 11.17 to go. CBS Sports coverage of the road to the Final Four is sponsored by Lexus Luxury Automobiles, the result of a relentless pursuit of perfection. Advil, advanced medicine for pain. And by right guard sports stick. Anything less would be uncivilized. Hey, Billy, tomorrow, Ohio State and Michigan. How do you see this one? Well, we saw Ohio State last week, Jim. They're a solid basketball team. And as I said before, they're trying to get that lineup organized with Funderburk now involved. Uh, Michigan's a team that we saw early on against uh, Duke University. Obviously very talented. And when they come to play, which... We saw today how much that meant for uh, St. John's. Uh, they, they're tough for anybody, including a club like Ohio State that's a solid top 10 team. Good passing, interior passing, and Middleton lays it in. The assist to Seeley. 15 off the bench for Lamont Middleton. Well, a couple of things shocked me about this game, and we have not seen Connecticut play a lackluster game in terms of effort. I, I can't remember in the last couple of years, Jim. And they just are not intense in this game at all. I mean, you can have games when you don't shoot well, you don't pass well, and maybe you have some things happen beyond defense, but they're just not playing with any intensity, which is not like a Jim Calhoun club. St. John's beating them with everything. I mean, they've got 16 second chance points. To Connecticut has none. And just, again, there. You know, you see Sellers and Walker not even going towards the ball. And Buchanan gets the rebound. Yeah. Point guard for the Johnnies. His sixth rebound. Connecticut not turning the ball over at all in the press. It'll turn it again. Yeah. He's got 17 now. Well, I watched him in practice yesterday, and I just had the feeling that he was going to be a factor down in low for his team. Not to this degree, obviously, but, but a factor. Marshall, nice move. He is going to be a big time player. He takes some big strides. Yes, he, he does. Go. And he's got the long arms that he can deliver the ball to the basket. We talked about a Hall of Famer, Connie Hawkins, and I'm not going to put Marshall in his class, certainly not at this age, because the Hawk was uh, special coming out of even high school. But he's got those same kind of long arms that deliver the ball when he drives. You yes, Middleton again. Three straight baskets for Lamont Middleton. Now at the other end, Daniel Marshall has scored all ten of his points in this half, and there's a turnover. Now in the last three games, Buchanan only had three total assists. And, and you know, here today he's been delivering the ball beautifully, regaining some of that confidence. As we we're talking about a second-team All-Big East player last year, predicted to be that again this year. 
and just has been in a terrible slump playing well today. Mitchell Foster comes back into the St. John's line. Oh, oh, oh. Brown put a move on Smith. Buchanan with 11 assists today. And I can't remember a turnover. He may have one, but I don't remember it. And a three. Oh, it's going to force a little bit. You see Connecticut not looking to go long. They get a rebound, everybody stands and watches. Smith, he'll fire it. Now Chris Smith has 14. A little point about Smith as a jump shooter. Whenever he squares up and looks down at the floor and is already squared, he's one of those few guys that can look at the floor and then elevate up for the jump shot. Most people have to have their eye on the basket. Smith on the hold. It's almost a tip off, but you know, when he looks down like that, that he's going to elevate up and take the jumper. I haven't scouted him enough to know that that's his uh, normal way of doing it, you know, each and every time. It's kind of like tipping off a pitcher's move. Kane is in for Buchanan, and Burrell comes back in for Sellers. 8.46 to go in the game. Calhoun trying to get something going offensively where he could turn the ball over. St. John's just handled it beautifully today. Remember that one-on-one -on -one move Kane made in the first half? Where he made the basket yep. and was fouled. Yep. Seely on the arm. He was hit, and he'll shoot for a three-point opportunity. Malik can do no wrong today. Fourth on Danielle Marshall. They just post up down and low. We're talking about, about posting up against the 13th best shot blocker in college basketball. Is Danielle Marshall, and he puts it right in over him. Number four on Marshall. And Seeley now 25 and 18. Well, he had 26 in the losing cause in the first game against Connecticut. So he certainly should exceed that today. Smith. Last touch by St. John's. As you look at Seeley, he's having a big day on his big day. It's his birthday today, Billy. He's 22 years old. That was off the of Yukon, so the Redmen have it. Maybe just too many things going against Connecticut. Seeley's birthday. Louis gets in the Hall of Fame. in the stars. Bobby Bonilla on the bench, right. right behind the bench, cheering on his favorite team. Barry Bonds shines, signs of 4.7. I mean, Louis's got too many things working for him. <laughs> Kane. <laughs> Serena Walker. Touch, smallest touch. You know, one of the things that, in, in talking to Louis yesterday, and, and this is off the subject of, of this actual game, and I don't, you know, Louis very seldom gets hot about anything, and he's always nice and calm. There you can see his attitude. But he was really annoyed by Dexter Cambridge's statements in that episode taking place at the University of Texas about somebody offering from St. John's offering him $30,000. And I, I don't think I've seen Louis as hot on a topic uh, in a long, long time. And he said, we have never been involved in anything like that. And he said, now that it's gone away, nobody wants to say anything about it. And he said, I, you know, I want to go on record. If there was such a person, bring him forward. And obviously, uh, or apparently, there was not some. But again, a damaging remark or insinuation kind of goes unnoticed when nobody makes a retraction. And now Cambridge is back playing for Texas. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I'm happy to see a guy have an opportunity to go back and play, but you got to wonder about the thinking that a guy can now repay $4,600 and be eligible again. Oh, Marshall. Never had a chance. Maybe Marshall. the first fast break opportunity of the day. Yeah, and still can't get it. Still can't get it. And don't convert. One of those other Hall of Famers, Al McGuire, always said it's good for a team to lose occasionally getting ready for the NCAA tournament. This is a game Connecticut will remember for the rest of this year. Brown gets hit in the eye. Poked in the eye by Chris Smith. Might have been in the nose. Yeah, it was the nose. And uh, 
Donnie Marshall's back in for UConn. Share a moment with the world. A preview of the Winter Games coming up Thursday night on CBS at 8 o'clock Eastern. Good cut by Kane. Foster going aggressively to the hole, but caught offensively against Foster. His fifth. One of the things that they worked on yesterday in practice is not to drive in out of control like that because it is going to be a charge. Al Balbo told Foster that very thing yesterday in practice. Why take it in there knowing they're going to draw the charge on you? Prior to today, many would tell you that St. John's was the most disappointed, disappointing team in all of college basketball this year. And now when you consider an effort like this and with Werdan coming back before the tournament, they'll sneak into the tournament, Billy, with a with a seeding where they could surprise some people. They could be back in the pack as a 7-8-9 seed and could find themselves in position to upset some people. Well, and on the topic of Robert Werdan, who they have not obviously had a chance to use today, he, he is running now in the swimming pool so he can, you know, get that calf muscle loosened up. And they assume that at the minimum it'll be two more weeks. The maximum he should be back in three. So there he is on the sideline. The young man who remember the game up in stores last year played extremely well against Connecticut in that big St. John's win. Think about this team though Billy once he comes back right on the eve of the tournament. Yep. Well you figure if it's three weeks he's got. He'll have, a, uh, he'll have uh, three weeks worth of games exactly. before the tournament starts. The, the tournament is one week later this year. There's Scott who set the stage for this game off the boards on the very first rebound of the game. Just ripped it off. Yeah, and had a couple of trips shortly thereafter that, as you say, really got this game going for St. John's. Lee Green is dribbling the basketball. And not what Louis Cardaseca wanted. It was Kane number two. He split the defenders, David Kane. Second drive of the game. 79-45. And Kane strips it at the other end. And here goes that fast break in St. John's team. I mean, they have taken advantage of every fast break opportunity from the get-go. Backdoor cut by Brown. Scott has blocked. Marshall ahead to Smith. Finally, a fast break for Connecticut. And that all started with Marshall on another block. Had you seven big blocks the other night. Already set the single season record at Connecticut. I'm going to give you a guy, though. You said in the first half you think that you haven't seen a player in a long time come onto the college scene with his shot blocking skills. We saw a guy last week who's pretty close. Thunderbird. And, and that what was interesting about Funderburk is the fact that in talking to Randy Ayers, they, he said in preseason practice, he didn't show that he was going to be a shot blocker. But he does get to the ball. Of course, we'll see a fairly good shot blocker next week when we go and see Shaquille O'Neal play. That's number five against Burrell. to think Shaquille's been looking forward to this game for a, a whole year after what happened at uh, Durham last year and the fact that Leitner posted such big numbers against him. Well, and we also know Dale Brown. Oh, there's a, one of the few times today that in regard to just a mental mistake, St. John's made it. And Kane fouled him also. They score the basket, and Burrell will have a three-point try. Jim talking about Duke Blue Devils they had their hands full this week down at Florida State game although the final score doesn't look like it was a problem that game was really uh, in the balance down the last couple of minutes you could see that one coming though you could see Florida State was going to be ready to give them a fit after having won at North Carolina and at Wake Forest beat Georgia and at Tech, Georgia Tech. Yep. one shot for Burrell interesting scenario in that league with Walt Williams up at Maryland, six straight games, 30 points or more uh, for a team that uh, has not won a conference game. Sarulik in for Donnie Marshall. And Connecticut never did make the run, Jim. I, I thought they did. I thought they would make a run not to win the game, but get it down maybe the 10, 12 points. They have never been in it. Richie Ashby defending on Buchanan. And Lee Green gets it back to Buchanan. 
Foul outside on Richie Ashby. And that was a good move by Buchanan, the fact that he knew where the solid screen was coming from and figured that Ashby would come over to meet the screen, so he went the other way. I was really surprised by Buchanan's slump. He seemed yeah. to be such a pure player. Here's a guy who grew up right in the Syracuse area, used to go to the Orangeman games at Manly Fieldhouse, was not a highly recruited player, not a Division I-A recruit until midway through his senior year, but has really had an outstanding run here with the Redmen. Yeah, you never thought he would be this year a great, look, look at he throws up an air ball there. Just, you know, a little lack of concentration on the shot. He's a little embarrassed about that one, but you never expected him to put up big numbers, but always to be solid. And so you know how frustrated Louis Conaseca has to be over the turn of events. Scott again, he's got men wide open. You can't seize him. Sporting, Cyrillic deflected it. And out to Richie Ashby. Pull up three by Smith. Oh, wow! That's the wingspan you were talking about, Billy. Well, I would say of all the Connecticut players, Marshall has played closest to his normal game today. Everybody else has been off. He did not score in the first half. All 12 of his points in the second stanza.